Uh, Marco Philippone. I got it right, didn't yeah, I? Right. Yeah. Water treatment superintendent. You know, up on uh, Lake Street, there's uh, where the water, where it's the end of uh, Long Pond. That's where I believe your office actually is, isn't it? Up there? Yep, I am on the southern end here. Yep, we're going to talk about that. That's me right there. So we're going to get right into that, but I also find something very interesting. And over here where the fire department is, there's a great big building, a white a water building, a brick building, that says Flanders on the top of it. I wonder why. Will you answer that question today? I will, as former superintendent Flanders. And actually, what you may know or may not know, if you know, I'll talk a little bit about the water plant when we kind of get there, when we get to the 1974 piece, but the driveway was actually dedicated to him. So when you look at it on a map, that is actually Ralph Flanders Drive. It's the entrance off the Hutchins Street. There's no street sign there. There was at one point. I was told somewhere in the 60s or so, a good winter storm, it got knocked over and disappeared. Well, now that, told, now that you've told now that you've told the Concord Historical mm -hmm. Society, yeah. we ought to insist on that sign going up, don't you yeah, think? The perfect spot for it, where we'll not get plowed over. Don't let me forget. All right. With the picture of a plot. Mark, are you Perfect, Jim. Thank you. I will move over here. Am I good? Am I out of your out of your sight? Okay. You're Got me, John. Okay. Perfect. Great. Well, first of all, thank you uh, for, for coming here to, to listen about water. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I've been in the water world for 34 years. I've been with Concord for eight years. So when anybody, when I was asked, hey, Marco, would you like to go talk about the history of Concord water? Uh, I, I just about fell over you know, saying yes, you know, because uh, I've been a water geek my entire professional career. And if anybody wants to listen to it, I'm going to talk about it. So uh, Concord has a very rich history in water, so thank you all uh, for coming. I have two plants in the audience because I wasn't sure how many people were going to be here. My beautiful wife decided to come along to heckle me a little bit. And I had a recent retirement from what I will, cl what I will classify as my best operator, and that is Mark Woodhead. So he just recently retired, and Mark, you were there for 36? Yeah, okay, so right at the end of your 36, right? I knew you got your 35-year pin, and it was a little gray if we made another full year, right? So correct me if I'm wrong on some of these history things, because you were pretty much there just after dirt was invented. You were there, all right? <laughs> right? Okay, okay, good, 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 good. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Again, I've been in the water world for 34 years, been in Concord for eight um, Born New Hampshire native, born in Manchester, uh, live over in Allenstown, just over the hill, uh, and I plan on finishing my career in this beautiful city. This is a chosen city for me. Eight years ago when I got the opportunity, again, I just about fell over to say, boy, are you kidding me? I'd love to work in a community like Concord. It's a great community. There's so much history and culture, and it's just such, such a great community. So um, let me talk about, I'm going to take you through uh, history, I'm going to start at the way back and then work our way to today. Okay, in other words, how did we get here today? But before we do, if you're wondering about the Concord water system, let me talk about that for a couple of minutes statistically. How does the Concord water system stack up with other systems in the state of New Hampshire, right? You say, okay, Concord has a water system, but so do all of these other communities. Well, uh, water systems are rated by capacity, size. In other, in other words, how much water can I produce? Right? How much water can I pull out of that lake, clean, and distribute to the community? Concord's water facility, we have a, and this is the plant up on Hutchins Street, and I will invite anybody, if you ever want to come and visit that, some of you have. Uh, if you ever want to after this, reach out to me. I'd be happy to give you a tour of the facility. So that facility up there is a 10 million gallon per day facility. Okay? That's what I can actually process through that plant. That makes it the third largest system in the state, behind Manchester at 50 million gallons per day and Nashua at 35 million gallons per day. So that puts us third in size, respectively, as far as water treatment capacity. Okay? So that's one of, the rate, one of the ways a water system is rated today. Our average daily production, when you look at over a year, is we produce 4 million gallons per day. Okay? So that's our average day. In the wintertime, you're going to see something in the low 3 million. Uh, a day like today is probably going to be closer to five. Yesterday was almost six million, a little warmer. We had some rain come in. Uh, the irrigation systems went off. And then we typically peak around eight million gallons a day. And I'll talk a little bit when we get to the future uh, that eight million gallons per day is a number uh, you may want to remember when we talk about it. Okay? 
So uh, this system is also what's classified as a T4 system. So depending on the complexity of the system, the treatment process itself, its size, water systems are rated one, two, three, or four, four being the most complex. There are only three T4 systems in New Hampshire. Concord is one of them, Manchester, Nashua, and Concord. Okay, so we are, T4, we are a T4 facility. The treatment plant, which treats every drop of water uh, in the city, that is the one treatment plant that the city of Concord has, uh, was constructed in 1974, as well as almost all of the water plants throughout the U.S. The U.S. EPA uh, came up with the Safe Drinking Water Act, and at that point in time, 74 was not all that long ago. I was certainly around, you know, so I say, wow, it's pretty amazing to think. Prior to 1974, there was no water treatment plant. Literally, you had a series of screens and that was your water filtration. You had three sets of screens that started out at half inch, went down to a quarter inch, went down to an eighth inch, and that was it for physical screening all the way through 1974. The process has changed dramatically. The Fed said, hey, you folks gotta do a better job for communities, so water plants were built all over uh, the U.S. in that 1973 to 1975, 76 range, okay? So our primary supply is Pennacook Lake. Right? Everybody's seen it. I'll talk about it a little bit because it started out as two ponds. It was not always Pennacook Lake. That lake, if we were to take every gallon out of it, holds four and a half billion gallons, right? That's billion with a B. I can actually access 1.5 billion, right? That means I can only draft off what I can out of the water treatment plant, but the deepest spots when that lake is full, as it is now, are 70 and 72 feet respectively. So we have two large kettle, kettle coal holes in there. Uh, and those are the deep spots. Obviously, I can't access that water that is deeper than the water plant itself, but I can access 1.5 billion gallons. And that is the average annual production of what I actually push through that plant, as I do about a billion and a half gallons a year. Okay. We also have a 1 million gallon per day well field that we use as emergency backup, and that's actually in Pembroke itself. If you know where Agway is, uh, it's on kind of the corner of 106 and North Pembroke Road. It's kind of on that corner. You actually got to drive across the little bridge, the new bridge on North Pembroke Road. And if you ever wondered what this driveway was with a big gate, that's our well field. It's also the police department shooting range, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> okay. Uh, but we use that only as a backup supply. The water quality isn't anywhere near what we can actually produce out of this plant. Okay, so that is a backup supply, but that gives us an extra uh, 1 million gallons per day. So we're also responsible. We've got 178 miles of pipeline. That's 178 miles that the city owns and maintains. There's easily another 30 miles of pipeline in private developments, some trailer parks, things like that, uh, that we don't own or maintain, but we push the water into it. So if you think of it this way, we've got enough pipe uh, that we push out of the plant to run back and forth to Boston a couple times, right, if you put it all end to end. So that's a lot of pipe that we've got to maintain. So when we look at uh, water system size, we look at number of customers. So when the state identifies this stuff, the size of the system, this T4, the classification, they also look at how many service connections do you have. Now a service connection can be somebody's residential house, that's one service connection, uh, or the state prison. The state prison is our number one customer, that is also one service connection, okay? Although they take between 250 and 350,000 gallons every single day. I don't know what they're doing with it, but they take a lot of water. Okay, so this system is 12,400 service connections-ish. Okay, so that makes it also the third largest distribution system in the state. Okay, so there's two classifications for water systems. The, the process itself is one, and then the distribution system uh, is the other. Okay, so that's, that's where we're at today. Okay, so let's take a walk back, way, way back. Okay. So when we dig through the records, we can dig up information back to 1829, okay? Concord Aqueduct Association at the time was providing water, and if you went back in that time, there was a series of water systems throughout, some official systems, some not official systems, okay? But in 1829, they were using springs at the base of Sand Hill, okay, as their primary supply. And uh, there were, again, there were other many private systems, wells, brooks, springs, basically wherever you could find the water. That's how uh, most systems are actually built. So this is nothing uncommon for Concord or any other larger community. That's typically how they all start. In 1849, the Torrent Aqueduct Association was organized. Okay, so that was one other system. And then Nathaniel White purchased a water system in the area of the now White's Park. Okay. So those two systems provided water for the next 23 years. 
Okay, so you had two systems providing water to the city, okay? Privately owned systems, not a municipally owned system at the time, okay? So 1872 rolled around, and a lot of stuff happened in 1872. In 1872, when Earthen Dam was built, and they joined Long Pond and Forge Pond, okay, to create Penacook Lake. So, uh, you know, some will say that was a man-made lake, if you will. It really started out as Long Pond and Forge Pond. You know, how did it, as people will ask me, how did it become Pentecook Lake? Well, there was human influence, right? What they had done was there were two ponds. One was at a different elevation than the other. They wanted to make it one, so they built a dam at the end of Forge Pond, tore the wall down between them, if you will, and that filled up Forge Pond, and now you created one body of water. I'm going to slide back a couple of slides just to show you, only because I go forward and it was a little light, just to kind of show you where that was. So where that was, this was Long Pond, and right here at what we call the Narrows, that was the separation. This was Forge Pond, okay, much smaller, okay, so you had Long Pond and Forge Pond. Okay, and when they were looking at expanding the water system, you really needed an area with decent flat geography, and there was nothing at the end of Long Pond that was attractive to do that. There was at the end of Forge Pond. Okay, so they chose that site, built the dam that still stands today, uh, and created Pentecook Lake. Which is the higher elevation? Which, which end? Which was? No, yeah. Uh, which, which end has yeah. the higher elevation? So, okay, so you're asking that, in other words, which way does it flow? Yep, so the higher elevation is here at this end. Water runs in this way, and then we run out. The outfall is this way, it's rattlesnake, Probably rattlesnake. Rope. The yep, actually there's all kinds of, all kinds of life uh, in that lake, and we can talk about it. We call this, this little dot here, that's Snake Island, we call it there, right? So you don't want to go visit that. I can show you on the boat, but you really don't want to jump out when it's nice and sunny out. They're all sunning themselves out on that lake, but yes, lots of turtles. The turtles like to actually stop on our, what we call our trash rack, because they like the water running by them, so we'll, we'll, they'll be right at the intake, and they're, they're something. Okay, so now, 1872, after that was built, now the water system is now managed by the city. Okay, so now it's not private ownership anymore, now the city owns it. In 1933, the Pembroke well field was constructed, okay? That is a unique system. I won't bore you with the science of it. It's pretty exciting. Mark was doing something on this just the other day, right, on some wells. And that was literally a field that, that was littered with 150 two and a half inch vacuum wells. So anybody on the mechanical side, you would actually insert a perforated pipe, inch and a half typically, uh, into the aquifer, if you will, pull a vacuum on that to pull all that water out. Now, you'd say, why 150? When you connect all those things together, you actually had a capacity of near half a million gallons per day. So that's why. The more you would actually put in, the more production you could actually pull out of these things, right? You put one or two, you can only pull so much. It's like sucking through a coffee straw. You get that straw bigger, bigger, bigger. Get the McDonald's, you're obviously pulling a lot more product, if you will, through that straw, okay? We still have that well field. I do not have the 150, two and a half inch wells. We actually put four conventional wells in there and I can pull a million gallons per day out of that facility right now, okay? Uh, in 1981, we'll skip forward to 1981, after a series of droughts, and if you look at the history, typically this area, every 10 years, we'll see a relatively steep drought, okay? That lake, uh, Pentecook Lake, I'll talk about the watershed a little bit uh, in a couple of slides. Mother Nature can only produce so much water in a watershed, okay? wasn't known back then really how much it can actually produce when it was dammed up. That number now, now we know is two, two and a half million gallons per day. So if you were paying attention, they said, hey, we average four million gallons per day. So if Mother Nature only produces two and a half on average, wouldn't I be running at a deficit and the lake should be empty? The answer is yes. So what happened is after a series of droughts in the 60s, there was actually water that was pulled from Turkey Pond temporarily uh, to feed the community with some overland. So in 1981, a raw water pumping station was built on Broad Cove Drive, and I can pull 10 million gallons per day, up to 10 million gallons per day, from the Kentucky River and push that into Pentecook Lake. Now that has not run since March of last year. But if you think of it this way, uh, we had the drought in 16 and 20, was it 20, two years ago? Those two years, I actually pumped a billion gallons out of the Kentucky River into that lake. 
and I push a billion and a half into the city. So in 2016 and 2020, most of the water to the city actually came from the Kentucky River. Okay, but it gives us that flexibility. And I say on average, it's been really wet for the last year and a half. I haven't run that thing at all. Mother Nature's given me more than, more than I need. Actually, I just stopped spilling uh, about two weeks ago. Okay, and today, Pentecook Lake is still our primary source, and it will be for the foreseeable future. Uh, when I say the foreseeable future, I'm going to say at least 75 years, and I'll talk a little bit about the future at the end. Okay. So 1872. Okay, I talked about that. I slid back, so I'll skip over it, only because we can't see this really good. But let me, let me just talk a little bit about the watershed itself. So we can kind of see the highlights of the lake, if you remember that first picture, right? Okay, the water plants down here. This line right here, if we walk that line, that is the ridge, right? So what happens is that's the watershed, okay? What does that mean? That means that if it rains, and it rains on this side of that line, that water is going to end up in the lake. If it rains on this side of that line, the water is going to end up in another, what we call another watershed, okay? So this watershed area is what produces all that water, uh, but it only, on average, produces two and a half million gallons per day. Okay. So let's slide forward a little bit to 1892. So what happened in 1892? Station One and the Pennacook Street Reservoir. So that was big news. Up until 1892, everything was gravity fed. The entire system was gravity fed from that lake, no pumps. Right, so you just basically had the elevation difference from that lake to down here in the city. And if you remember, urban sprawl typically happens near a body of water, so you're down by the river. And then as anything grows, you grow away from the river, which has elevation. Right? So by 1892, you had development that was getting higher, almost as high as the lake, so you had no water pressure, if you will. You couldn't have a clean water supply or public water supply. So what do you do in that case? You start building stations and tanks. Okay? So in 1992, we had Station 1 and Pentecook Street Re Reservoir. Everybody here probably drove by Station 1 today. And you probably say, what is Station 1? Does anybody recognize that? OK, there, that, is, that is the winter of 1892. And this is the spring of 1893. OK, if you're still wondering what it is, does that look familiar? <laughs> Okay, so fire headquarters is the old water department pump station one. Okay, All right. So everybody's zooming right by it, right around the corner, right, right around the corner. So and if you actually next time you stop at the light, you're going to do that. Now that I'm saying this, you're going to look at this right here, and right in brick it says City Waterworks. Okay, that is the old station one. Okay, so what does the city do? We repurposed it. Uh, when we came up with other pumping stations, I'll get into that, that was in the 1940s. Uh, now we had this beautiful facility uh, that the city owned, and there was certainly a need for, for fire department at some point in time, so that has been now converted. Uh, I'm jealous of that. A lot of the piping is still actually in the basement. Uh, so when I, went, when I first came here eight years ago, I did some training in there, and on break, I ran downstairs, and they said, what are you doing, looking at the records? I said, no, I want to look at the pipes in this place, because it is quite impressive. Again, water geek talk. Okay, so that's station one. So now the water is flowing gravity from Pentecook Lake down to this pump station one. Okay, and this is a coal fired pump. This was the second one in the US, okay, that was constructed that it was of this design. A rail was actually built from the main railway right into, uh, there was actually a coal building which is no longer there anymore. They would actually run it right up, dump the coal, and then off they would go. So that was constructed back in 1892, which, which is now gone. And then it would pump and push up to the Pennacook Street Reservoir. Okay. Anybody familiar with the area now? There is a small park up there where I have a 2 million gallon water tank. It's kind of hidden back there. That was a 2 million gallon open reservoir. Okay. So in 1892, you had all these folks looking over at this camera saying, what are you doing? Right? What is that thing? Taking their picture. And what they're doing is they're actually digging out and clearing for a 2 million gallon storage tank. Now that was providing fire protection storage, but more importantly now it was creating a different pressure zone. So now you could build homes and businesses in higher elevations. OK, 
Okay? You continued to provide water, you created a separate pressure zone. So you continued to provide water to the lower areas of the city by gravity, and now you had a second system where you could now actually start building higher. Okay? So you got some pretty, pretty strong, rugged people. You don't see any excavators in this picture now, do you? 1892, right? So a lot of it was done by hand and mule, right? When you kind of dig through the records too, I was digging through the records to get this picture, you find some really neat stuff, and it was, they found, they knew they had rock in the area, so, but uh, the rock was uh, more broken up than they had expected, so there was a lot of discussion about how they would do it, and they blasted it, and it blasted smaller than they expected, so there was an issue with the foundation, but uh, uh, needless to say, they got it built, and it, uh, it worked as an open reservoir until the 1980s. Okay. So initially this was an open reservoir. Uh, I hear again stories from the elders that said, oh yeah, we used to sneak in there and go for a swim, uh, you know, when nobody, would, uh, when nobody would be there. Of course, that was the drinking water, no different than the lake. Uh, and then in the 70s it got covered. Right? There are still open reservoirs out there, but they're, they have what's called a floating cover. Right? They're still in use today. Okay, so pretty neat thing. So in 1892, now we're expanding the system to a larger area to provide more service. We're kind of heading towards the high school area, if you will. Okay. So let me talk about Pennacook Lake. Somebody is going to ask me, uh, why is the lake closed for recreation? So let me answer that for you. Okay. If you go back in that history, in the late 1800s, right, in early 1900s, you could pick up po postcards, send this to your family that are not living nearby, showing beautiful Pennacook Lake and basically writing them a note and saying, come on, please recreate uh, in our, our beautiful lake. And it is beautiful and pristine. Okay? And remember at the time, this is not just something that, that was with Concord. Everybody understands Manchester. Manchester had Massabesic Lake, which is still their primary water supply. But a lot of the workers would recreate on the weekends. They actually had a, uh, you know, a train track running up to Massabesic. Uh, and that's just how everything was. So in Concord, it was Pinnacook Lake where you would actually recreate, right? It's a class A body of water, right? The water is very clean and clear. It's a great place to recreate. So you had a lot of activity actually in that lake in, in the early 1900s. Late 1800s, early 1900s, a lot of activity. Boat houses were everywhere, as it would be, right, if you're recreating in a lake. And again, these are all cards that you could easily get. Okay. So a lot of recreation was happening on the lake, right? Not necessarily a bad thing. So let me point something out, though, in this, in this postcard that I'll talk about a little bit that led to the closing of the lake for recreational purposes. This right here is what's called the screen house. Okay? That's the actual intake. Okay? This is an artist's rendering of it. I'll show you a real picture of it back in the day. So this is the actual intake. So you go down about 9, 10 feet, the water is entering into a pipe and it is connected directly with the entire distribution system anywhere. If you, could, if you were microscopic and you could swim through that pipe, you could run into any building facility, come out any sink, right? There's a direct connection. So you're recreating near it, right? Again, which is okay, relatively okay if you're doing disinfection and things, which they were after 1910. Okay? I'll come back to that screen house. St. Paul's was also on the property, on the lake. They owned a lot of property around there. They still do own some property, uh, some landlocked property in the area. So that's St. Paul's boathouse. So St. Paul's was very big on the rowing, right, on the crew teams. We've all seen those. Actually, if you uh, drive by the end. I'm sure if you've looked in the lake, you've seen what looks like a, a boat launch, a ramp, a concrete launch there. That is actually remnants from this. If you get to it from the lake side, if you talk to me real nice, I'll get you on my boat and show you. Uh, when you come in, you can actually see how they would climb over the wall with their small little skinny boats in the middle, mount the boats, and then out they would go. Okay. So this was a very normal, uh, a normal thing for the school. Okay. You can see everybody's kind of lining up on the lake for their for the rows, okay, race day, place gets, gets pretty busy, you can see a lot of trees that were taken down in the area, obviously for the forest thing that was done back in the day, okay, so we're all getting ready for race day, so a very, very busy body of water, if you think about it, also the primary supply for Concord, right, not only is Concord 
home for residences, but it is also the capital of the city. Okay? So and the capital is not going to be going anywhere. Right? So think of this as, as I'm going through what's, what's going to be coming up next, how this happened. Okay? So in the 1940s, uh, the city actually started acquiring a lot of the property, right, the waterfront property along the lake to control it, to protect it. Okay? You can see here, this is not an artist's rendering. Okay, you can see that's actually what I call the greenhouse. There's two sets of half-inch screens in there. That is the only barrier between the water itself and there's a swimming platform right there and a boat. And you can see the water level is relatively low. Right now, if you came by today, that catwalk, the water is about three inches below that catwalk, just to give you an idea of how low it was. So they were clearly dealing with a drought back in this time period. Okay. Did you back up to that picture? That's Absolutely. To the building on the this one right here? Yeah. Okay. Brown building? Yep. So that is that what we call this, we call that one the gatehouse now. So that actually served a purpose for cleaning. So if you were to come from the water side, there were three layers of physical screening back then. Again, this is prior to 74, so all the way up to 74, this was screening. In this building right here, you had two sets of half inch mesh screens. Not much different than say the window screen in your house, right? Other than the mesh is a half inch square. Okay, so if you were larger than half inch, you would get caught up on one of those screens. And it was somebody's job every day, somebody was living in one of these houses, to go out, pull the screens up, clean it off, put it back in, right, to catch the debris. And you had two half inch screens, because obviously when you pull one out, you would have no screening, so you have a second one behind it, and then you would just continue to flip flop. Then it would actually go underneath this dam, and this is that earthen dam that was built in 1872. Okay, an earthen dam is nothing more than rocks and sand, right? That's, that's what was built back in 1872, okay? So you had three pipes that went underneath this dam and into the second building that we call the gatehouse, and there was two more screens there. So you went half inch here, two half inch mesh screens here, then you went down smaller, you went a quarter inch. So if you went through the half inch, you could get caught up in the quarter inch. If you didn't get caught up in the quarter inch, you would get caught up hopefully in the last one, which was one eighth of an inch. If you were smaller than one eighth of an inch, you are in the distribution system. Still pretty muddy water. Still pretty muddy. And, and, an, interest, and an interesting fact, if you, if you talk to some folks about the olden days in water systems, right, they would say, you know, whenever there was a fire in town, we would have muddy water for days, right? And a lot of folks think, uh, you know, it had something to do with the way the fire department was running the water pumps and things like that. It had nothing to do with it. Think about all the small material like silt that would absolutely get through all of those screens, right, smaller than an eighth inch. Well, they have a little weight to them. So they go out and then they settle out in the water mains. Now, when you have a large flow event like a fire, everything gets stirred up, right? It's like chocolate milk, right? You let it settle, chocolate will go to the bottom, give it a shake, it'll start to mix up again. So that's what would happen because you, you were only mechanically filtering down to an eighth inch. And the reason why they didn't necessarily go tighter than that is they had a hard time getting a screen that tight and then it would plug so often that you'd be cleaning it all the time. So typically, and again, this is throughout the US, they would stop at an eighth inch mesh screen as your final filtration, if you will. And even page belting is not build up. Right, yeah. Today, if you come up to the plant now, you've got what's, what's called a physical barrier. So I have 22 inches of granular activated carbon and 15 inches of silica sand that that water has to go through. So nothing gets through it, right? Basically nothing. Okay, okay, so remember that. So again, so, the straw that broke the ha camel's back, and again, I get this from, uh, I got this from probably six reputable elders, and they said, and, and don't shoot me for this, Marco, the Greeks ruined it. And I said, the Greeks ruined what? And he said, no, they ruined this thing for recreation. I said, depends how you look at it, right? Well, let's talk about it. You know, how, how did the Greeks ruin it? Well, this is at the other end of the lake, right where the plant is now, so if you can see right there, that's the greenhouse, okay? So that is the intake. So you could actually rent this for weddings, parties, things like that. Uh, somebody had actually rented it, and there was an outhouse on the shore of the lake. So I guess the party was pretty good, pretty bad, I guess, depending on how you rate it. Got a little out of hand. The outhouse got pushed into uh, the lake. The intake, of course, is right there. Shortly thereafter, a bacterial outbreak in the water system in the city of Com. So now it's decision time, right? So now. Uh, 
you're looking at what caused this thing. Everything comes back, obviously, to the supply. They, this was a known uh, incident. So it was, well, what are we going to do? Uh, so the city had a decision to make, right? It's either treatment technology, which really wasn't around back then, you know, a tight treatment technology, or it was protect the source, okay? So what Concord decided to do is they said, hey, you know, there are not multiple large production lakes with high quality water around every corner, right? Where do you go? How do you replace something like this to leave it open for recreation? And there was a lot of discussion about it. It says, well, what can we do? Do we go to the Merrimack? Clearly at that point in time, the Merrimack was not a very clean body of water, so that, that was a quick discussion. A lot of the other lakes and ponds around there didn't have the capacity or the quality. So then at that point, they determined, they says, you know what, we need to protect this lake for the future of Concord. The capital is not going away anywhere, right? There's a lot of construction to be built. There's a lot of land mass in Concord. So they said, we need to secure this. And how we're going to secure this is we're going to close it off to recreation. And if you understand New Hampshire, you say, geez, I'm, I'm closing off, you know, a body of water for folks to recreate in. There's over 3,000 lakes of that size or larger in the state of New Hampshire. So if you close one, is it really going to affect, hey, I can't go fishing there anymore? And you've got 2,999 other choices, you know, where you can kind of go fishing. Water supplies, again, are not around every corner. So the decision was made at that point in time that the city would continue uh, acquiring the property to control that and actually put restrictions on the lake itself. So there's actually local ordinance, and I'll get to that in a couple of slides, that restricts what you can do uh, in that lake. So by 1951, everybody's off the lake, okay? It is banned by local ordinance. The city now owns all the abutting property, and the two St. Paul's boathouses were moved off of that lake as well, and those are actually the same boathouses that are on Turkey Pond right now. They're a little bigger. I know they've modified them a little bit. I've, I've talked to uh, uh, some of the folks over there, and they said, yep, the core of them is still the same boathouses that were there in the early 1900s. So pretty impressive structures, right? So everybody is now off that lake. So how do you make sure nobody sneaks in there, gets in there, and contaminates it? So you need to support it by local law. So there is local Sydney Ordinance 9-2. I won't bore you with every detail on it, but basically it says you cannot recreate, you can't swim, fish, hike. Uh, there are a couple caveats in there, which is still used to this day. Uh, the, let's see, I think it's the second, one, two, three, four. This one right here actually reads, we actually partner with Fish and Game. So a lot of that was conversation with Fish and Game when we said we're going to close this off because it's the water supply. Remember, Fish and Game is one of our customers, right? So uh, if they have a bad year at their hatcheries, they can come net uh, with our approval, right? They have not done it yet, but we did partner with them. We tried some sunapee trout in there. Uh, you know, they've done a couple of pilot programs for fish health. Uh, Sun if trout didn't do very well, the bass ate them all, so we had some really fat bass for a while, which was good for them. But that local ordinance basically says you can't do anything on this body of water and all property that is attached to it that the city owns. So that's how it reads, okay? And we own a little over 900 acres, okay? It actually says in here, too, that I can, uh, if, if I catch you walking on it, it talks about the superintendent, that's me. I guess I'm a pretty powerful guy right now. It says if I catch you walking on the property, I could say you could be potentially contaminating the source and have you arrested. And of course, the police department wants to do that for me. You know? so we don't do I haven't done that yet, but some of my friends have dared them. I just want to see if it works, you know, get them arrested. Okay. But pretty neat, if you, if you look, if you dig deeper in this ordinance, uh, there's a couple sections to it, and it talks about can't drive your cattle across it, which is something that obviously used to happen. Can't harvest ice anymore without our approval because there was a lot of ice harvesting on this lake. Uh, can't run a sawmill on it because uh, a lot of property around there, when you would do your milling, you'd have your mobile sawmills, right? You would just move them around, and then you would use the lake to carry the logs. So a lot of that is actually written into that, right? You can't do any of that stuff. Uh, so Concord's not the only one that does this. Uh, Rochester has some bodies of water that are completely closed off. Hanover does. Some others have uh, limited restrictions, like Massabesic. There was just no way that Manchester could close that off with all the recreation that was happening up there. Um, and uh, they wish they were conquered, uh, I'll be honest with you, and I'll talk about why in, in, a, in a, a slide or two. Um, but ours is completely closed off, and anybody who say comes to New Hampshire, you want to learn about the lakes, you're going to see it right here on Lakes and Ponds. In the second paragraph, it says, be aware some bodies of water, including Pentecook Lake, are closed for recreational activity because they are uh, primary sources of water for communities. Okay? 
actually mentions Massa Visek too, saying limited restrictions. In other words, uh, educate yourself. So that watershed I talked about, that drainage area that all the water comes in, it's just under 2,500 acres. Okay? And the city owns 913 of those acres. So we own almost half. Okay? There's another 51 acres that are actually protected uh, under permanent easement, right, in perpetuity. So it's either a land trust or uh, the state of New Hampshire owns some. Okay? So uh, I always get asked, well, Marco, you know, you, you've got this water filtration plant. I mean, you know, you should allow recreational activity to happen. Uh, you know, you've got this plant that takes all of this stuff out. And we do have technology to remove all of that, right? But now you're relying on technology. And, and technology, a plant is a piece of equipment, right? Equipment fails. Has everybody's car ever run the entire time you owned it? Right now, you know, you have these bumps in the road. So you look back and you say, hey, what has shutting down this lake done for the health uh, of that lake. Well, as of today, it is still uh, the only large body of water in the greater Concord area that is not milfoil infested. It is the only one. Lake Massabesic, all these other public water supplies, Nashua, they're all milfoil infested. Right? Milfoil is not native to this area. It's brought in on a boat. Nobody does it on purpose. Right? Somebody jumps from uh, you know, their kayak from one body of water to another, and I, do, I kayak as well. That's how it gets in. And once it gets into a body of water, it never gets out. Never. Okay, now it becomes harvesting, right? So now it's another thing that I need to control, right? It's very invasive and very aggressive, okay? So that's why it was closed off, and that's been the benefit of it. Uh, those of you on the financial side, you know, you might say, geez, that's a lot of property we could get tax revenue from. You're absolutely right. What the city does, though, is we actually harvest that. So we grow trees out there, right? Number one, for the health of the water. So we want to make sure we get a lot of pines, you know, which do a great job of filtering out the water itself but also we harvest it, so we, we timber cut periodically. That money goes back to the city, not the water department, right? in lieu of taxes, okay? so the city benefits from it. Okay, 1947, station four, we're expanding the pressure zone again. Right? The city's getting bigger. Okay. So 1947, you read the annual report and it says, hey, We've got low pressure areas in Pennacook and in getting into the Heights areas, right? Up Loudon Road and up heading towards the high school, right? We've got to address it. So how do we do that? Well, we build a new pumping station, okay? They say we're gonna build a new pumping station. And that is this pumping station number four. Mark has been in it 36 years up until last year. And it's still running right now, by the way. It's still running right now. Uh, so this station was built actually at the base of the dam uh, up off of Hutchins Street, and that now is providing pressure to a larger area. So Station 1, this is when Station 1 now is no longer needed. Now Station 1 did not push enough water, so we built a new one to take out Station 1. Okay. So this gets built. So what areas am I talking about? Hopefully you can see that a little bit. It's a little washed out. Right, so there's Concord. Here's 93. Here's 89. There's the lake, Hutchins Street. Okay. This is the area that was being served, right? Pentecook, Fisherville Road, and then the downtown area. That was good, but now we're expanding. We're getting urban sprawl, okay? So that's the area we're looking to address. So now we're expanding that service area. It's all based on elevation. If we had a topo map, you'd see, you know, the elevation just continues to go up, right? Outside of, outside of the rivers, okay? So that is built, okay? And it is still serving us today. Let's slide ahead to 1974. What happened in 74? Mm. The water treatment plant. Built. 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 Yes. Yep. Built 1974. Yep. Some federal money, some city money. Uh, yep. Great, great project. So this was that physical barrier I was talking about. So prior to 74, you just had those four screens. Two half inch, one quarter inch, one eighth inch, that was your filtration process. Now EPA says you guys got to do better than that, and this is national, right? So we build our water treatment plant. Okay. So again, prior to, this was the filtration process. The screenhouse with two screens in it, three lines underneath the dam, 
two sets of screens in there, and then of course some control gates. That's why we called it the gatehouse. If you needed to, there were three lines going out of there. One would actually go to Penacook, two would actually go downtown Concord. So if you needed to isolate anything, you would actually go in the gatehouse and turn down, uh, turn off whichever 20 inch water main uh, you needed to isolate it. So in 1974, this is now built. Okay, the water no longer running through the screen house and the gatehouse. So those, after this was built, this is actually filled with concrete and they serve no physical purpose other than it is the centerpiece uh, of this facility. I'm looking to get it on the National Historical Register for American Water Works Association. Um, actually, the roof was re-shingled with asphalt shingles and somebody, thank the Lord, actually kept the old slate. I found it in my warehouse. So I'm gonna put that uh, back on someday, some project, right, when we get a few extra, few extra bucks to get that back to uh, its original condition, okay? So now the water goes through this entire facility and that facility is rated at 10 million gallons per day. So when I talk about that T4 and what the state does, that's what that rating is, okay? So that facility can process 10 million gallons per day. Another key part of that, so this facility cleans the water this little field over here that you see, that is what we call a clear well or a contact chamber. And that holds right now 4.7 million gallons of treated water. Okay, so that's ready to go right now. Okay. And that's used for disinfection purposes and also for uh, supply. Think of it this way. Um, water treatment plants, this treatment plant, doesn't like to go from 2 million gallons per day to 8 million gallons per day like that. Right, you upset the filters and we have certain regulations we need to meet, so we can't do that. But, uh, everybody remember the Stratum tire fire a few years ago? Okay, so when a tire place goes up, everybody rallies, right? All the, all the communities come in and we gotta put this fire out, so everybody is now tagging onto the fire hydrants. So I literally was coming into work and I saw the cloud and I said, that's me, that's Concord. I didn't know what was up. And right as I thought it, my phone rang. And uh, it was uh, Jim Major, actually highway guy, he says, hey, I don't know if you know, Stratum tire's on. Give us everything you got. So the water plant doesn't push the water into the city. Station four does. So station four pulls water out of this. So I literally pulled over on the side of the road, took my iPhone out, connected in, so we have that technology now, and I ramped that place up in about 25 seconds. Okay? So I gave them all the water that they needed. Now what it is though is this facility can't go that quick. It'll literally take 25, 30 minutes for me to do that. But when you have 4.7 million gallons of water ready to go, that is not a problem. You pull out of that, I ramp this place up in a half hour I'm running, and then when they shut the hydrants down, I run it for another half hour, top it. Yes? Uh, what is that underground tank made of? Concrete. Yeah, so it's basically an open. Yeah, so the walls are 18 inches thick, reinforced rebar walls. So actually, we've just been in there the past couple of years, and the new station I'm building, I'll show you, is actually up in this corner. So it's basically like a house foundation. And what it is, it's actually split in two. Say I had a problem in, in there and I needed to get in there to maintain it, we do to, to inspect it. I gotta keep the water system going, right? This, this water system runs 24 seven, 365. We, we don't shut down, right? The community doesn't shut down. So it's built specifically, it's like a house foundation with a divider wall in the middle of it. Oh, in height, 15 feet deep. Yep, yep. 15 feet, uh, 208 by 200 feet. Yeah, 4.7 million gallons, got a lot of water. Yeah. yeah. So just to kind of recap, so now we've got this supply identified, right? We've got this water plant built. Uh, so now the city is looking to protect this, right? Well into the future. So what do we do? What does the city do? Well, we've identified, we've figured out what is the drainage area that leads into the lake? Where's that water come from, right? So we've identified it as a watershed. And fortunately for us, and again, a lot of communities wish they were us. Our entire watershed sits in our political boundaries. If you talk to a Manchester or a Rochester or a Hanover where their watersheds go into another community, other communities looking for tax revenue, look to tax watershed property right, at full value. So they have that to deal with. Uh, Manchester ended up putting all of their property outside of the city limits and conservation. It's the only way they could get the tax benefit. Otherwise, the water rate payers Right, are subsidizing the taxes in Auburn. So fortunately for Concord, 
everything sits within our political boundaries in that watershed, okay? So now we can actually protect it. So now there's a zoning district, okay, that protects that as well as other, I don't know if I have another slide, all other water producing bodies of water were identified and they were zoned specifically for that protection. So you can only do certain things. So if you own a piece of property in that watershed, you're limited to four acre minimum and you're, you are limited to uh, residential construction only. So the only contamination that's gonna actually enter the lake is the septic system. So no, uh, no more farms, if you will. So that's how we are actually controlling contamination coming into the lake, yes? Does the apple orchard have any effect as far as fertilizers? So we're very fortunate. There's only a small corner, okay, that is actually of that orchard. So if you've been to the orchard, you know, when you're on top of the hill, if you're on the lake side, that is the only, they are actually part of that ridge. Right? I'll tell you, where the orchard water goes right through my lawn. You're right, it does. Yep. Absolutely. Yep, on the other side. Yep, you're on the other side of that. Yep, yeah, exactly. So on that ridge, if you went to the top of that ridge, anything on the lake side goes to me, anything on your side, I'm sorry, goes to you. Yep, yep, another pond up there, yep. Okay, so just to show you kind of the numbers, so if we look at that now, that 2,500 acre watershed, how do we protect that? 2,500 acres total, 1,035 are actually protected, okay, in perpetuity, the city owns 913. 51 are in a private land trust, right, that are city held. 71 are, uh, are separate private land trusts, but if you understand that, obviously they are permanently protected. Uh, the state also owns 182. So the backside of the prison, they own a lot of property on the backside of the prison that abuts the property that we own. So we actually have an agreement with the state. If they ever decide to sell off that property, we get first right of refusal. Uh, which we would just simply acquire. They won't, because they're obviously they're looking at expanding, that kind of thing, but if they ever did, that's what we would do, okay? So that's how we protect. Oh, I did put another slide. So talking about the protection, right, for water protection districts, that is the Pentecook Lake Water District, and then these other areas are identified as water-bearing areas, so they are zoned specifically like that. We actually share a little bit with Pembroke, um, Pembroke has a couple of supply wells down in this area, but their protective radius comes into Concord. So if we ever have any development going in that area, we notify Pembroke. Pembroke does the same thing for me, where we have our protective radiuses in Pembroke, and if they have anything going on in that area, they invite us to the table to see, uh, to see what's going on. Okay, now it's 1981. What happens in 81? Well, in 81, we built a pumping station. Right near the banks of the Kentuckuk River, and we call that now our Station 5. What does that thing do? Well, we built several miles of pipeline, and we actually now physically connected the Kentuckuk River with Pentecook Lake. Okay, but every 10 years I talked about, you actually had a drought, a drought of record, if you will, where Pentecook Lake was producing zero. Right? It's actually physically producing nothing. So the city is consuming water at a rate of four or five million gallons per day, and you've got nothing coming in, and you can only get to that certain point. If you remember that one picture I showed you where the screen house was, uh, was very low, that's what you would actually get. So if you look at the historical record, I think it was in the 60s, they actually had some overland pipe from Turkey Pond. Uh, they went through St. Paul's School and actually pushed the water to the lake to supplement the lake. So they determined, you know what, we need to do something. There is no other large body of water, so what are we going to do? Well, they looked at the Merrimack River. Again, the water quality there in the Merrimack River, as we all know, was relatively suspect for quite some time. Uh, it was on the top 100 uh, dirtiest rivers in the country for, for many decades. Uh, but the Kentuckuk River was nowhere, nowhere as dirty, and it was actually physically closer. Okay. So that was built, and if you just looked at it graphically, I apologize, it's actually a little light. So here's Pentecook Lake. This is the general service area now, right? So we don't service everybody in Concord, okay? These are, if you're out in this area, you're on a, you're on a well, as you were, it's totally. And then right here on Broad Cove Drive, that's where that pumping station is, and it is an overland line, excuse me, not overland, it is a buried line that runs into Pentecook Lake. So that is relatively remote. The electrical system actually can't support what I have down there. I have 350 horse pumps. So we actually run that off of a diesel generator. The 200 to 400 gallons of diesel a day when I got to run that thing to move about 8 million. Typically we run it, I'd run 8 million gallons a day. 
uh, to supplement the lake, only in dry periods, as you would imagine. Okay? So that's how we safely can push 10 million gallons per day to the city. Okay? That's, how that, that's how that supply works. It becomes a little bit of a math game sometimes in the spring. All right, so now 2021, how am I doing? I don't want anybody home too, too late. So 2021, I am now replacing station four that was built in the 1940s. Typical pump stations like that, they get turned on and they don't shut off, right? So we've been pushing water out of that building pretty much 24 seven since the 1940s. The envelope is getting a little tired. It is actually in the spillway of the dam. So the, the dam was built in 1872. This building that was built in the 40s to push water, the, the flattest spot they had was at the base of the dam. Good and bad, it was a nice flat spot. However, it's a high hazard dam. If that dam failed today, that building will end up in the Merrimack River, okay? So uh, if the dam fails and that building goes into the Merrimack River, when the water recedes, now I have no pumping station to push water into the city, okay? So now the city is at a halt until I can build another water pumping station, which you cannot do overnight. How do you build a 10 million gallon per day water pumping station with safe water in any short period of time? So we determined that location was not where we needed that thing. So if I was going to rebuild the station in place, I would still be dealing with a modern station that is now still in the spillway of the dam, right? So I still have a big problem. So we did lots of studies and determined that we needed to move it out of the spillway, but to do it efficiently, as efficiently as we could, upgrading that station. And that's what we're doing right now. So right now, this is that existing plant. If you remember those pictures, here's the old screen house and gatehouse. I am building a new 10 million gallon per day. Actually, that'll push me to 12 million gallons per day. So I can actually push more water into the city than I have behind me, if you can understand that. I am building this new pumping station as we speak. So that was started in January 1 of 2021. I was supposed to flip the switch May 16th of this year, but as everybody has heard with supply chain issues, COVID, that has been delayed. I've been very fortunate uh, up front. I brought the contract in and said, buy all the parts now, order them day one, house them, I'll pay you for them, and then we'll put this thing together. So I'm only delayed to mid-September. So we're in very good shape. Uh, the good news is that station that Mark did such a good job maintaining over his 36 years still runs good. I haven't had to fire Bertha up yet. Hopefully I don't. She's the only one that gives me trouble. Uh, and that's what we're doing. So what does that look like today? This actually isn't today, but this is the new building that's being built. And again, that will have modern, more efficient pumps than we have now. So we're going to get electrical savings out of it. And if you look, just to kind of show you, here is the dam itself, all right? It's a little optical illusion that basically lines up here. So if the dam fails, that building stays there. Station four, the existing one, is actually in this hole. So you would, the, the roof of station four is below the water level, right? Okay, so that's why, that's why that is being replaced where it is being replaced. So come September, I'll have to have a, campaign party or something, right? It's been a year and a half project that's going on two years, but a good project, right? So let's talk about the future a little bit. So now I've talked about the history, you kind of understand what got us to here, how the system is. Um, we don't just work behind us, I spend a lot of time looking to the future, right? So I need to make sure that Concord is gonna have an abundant water supply so that Concord can grow and do whatever it needs to grow well into the future. So we do a lot of planning. And we call it master planning. So every 10 years, I look at the supply itself. This last one was done in 2016. It's done in three pieces. I won't bore you with the other pieces. But we look at it and we say, okay, I've got this 10 million gallon per day facility. How long is this gonna last, right? When, when do I get to that point where uh, I gotta build another plant? I kinda need to know ahead of time, because if it takes me two years to build a small pumping station, what's it gonna take me to build a water treatment plant, a whole new water supply? And where am I going, right? Where's the water around here, okay? So in 2016, um, you know, we looked at it and said, hey, we need, to, we need to tie when we need this to something. So we based it off of population, okay? And in 2006, uh, it basically said, hey, Marco, you're gonna be at uh, eight and a half million gallons per day peak by the year 2025. And remember, I have to react to peaks, right? I have to, I have to be able to, to handle 
the heavy loads, the July 4th weekends when everybody's using the water, everybody's in the pool, washing the cars, doing all that. That four million gallon average per day doesn't do me any good when I don't have enough water when everybody needs it. Okay? So we always look at the peak. So in 2006, I said, hey, Marco, you've got to build your water plant by the year 2025. Well, in 2016, we took a look at it and said, boy, Concord is not growing, and it's actually a New England thing. Right? The population just isn't coming into Concord. Uh, we're not a very industrial community, so it would be different if we had Coors Brewing or Guinness. Somebody told me Guinness. They wanted Guinness to come into town. That would be a little different. So we redid our projections, and what's happening is you're actually getting water conservation, whether you know it or not. Anybody go to... Home Depot and have to replace a toilet lately, you don't get a five gallon flush toilet anymore. You know, it's a gallon and a half, you know, so there's a lot of water conservation going on and you hear it, buy my dishwasher, but it's an energy saver, it's this and that, it only uses four gallons, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of that stuff happens. So actually, residential consumption has been going down over the years as the growth has been happening. So we've been basically averaging four million gallons per day for about 10 years, okay? But I still need to plan, right? So we basically said, hey, when Concord gets to 50,000, I need to be at 12 million gallons per day, okay? So that doesn't happen overnight. I can't wait until we're at 50,000 and then I go, hey guys, I gotta I got build a plan, right? I gotta go to city council, I gotta get this thing laid out, I gotta go to DES. So we projected that out relatively conservatively that we're looking in the 2040 range. So right around 2035, I gotta start looking for a supply and 2040 hopefully have it built or well under construction. But we look at population all the time, right? Population, and I, I log everything, every gallon that I pump every day, right? So I've got a ton of history to do that. So where do we go? Where's Concord going to go? Okay. So uh, with the population at 50,000, we've got to go from 10 to 12 million. There is no additional capacity in the Kentucky River. I cannot pull out any more water in the river. The state will not allow me to do it. If I actually went in to modify my permit now, they would knock my my quantity down. So I safely have 10 million there, and that's it. Remember, the lake sometimes gets dry, and I have to assume it's gonna be dry. So we're going to the Merrimack River. The Merrimack River has what's called a safe yield, we call it a 7Q10, of 21 million gallons per day. That will take Concord to its full buildup, okay? Full buildup, if we were serving everybody in the community. So we would build a new plant on the shores of the river and continue to maintain the plant up here, right? The city has a huge investment in that, that water plant, and it's a very efficient water plant, right? But as it ages, so let's look, you know, this plant gets built in 2040, well past my career and lifespan, right? 60, 70, 80 years, that continues to get old, and at some point in time, we're either gonna have to replace that facility, or if we're wise, when we build our new facility on the shores of the Merrimack, we build it modular, where we can actually expand it. So I build one that's, say, two million, or two to five million, you'd build a five million one, and then as, say, the one up on Hutchins Street ages, I add another five million to that one, add another five million to that, and then potentially we actually take the raw water up there and just pipe it down and use that water as well. Or the city could determine that they want to sell the property for, for whatever they want to do. Yes? What's the average amount of water you like? So, you know, you'd be surprised, you know, when you think about peak days, July 4th is not our peak day. Typically, my peak day, is usually right around now or late May. And it has to do with the weather, because typically what happens, everybody comes out of spring, right, the spring fog, and then everybody says, and, and if I asked anybody, what day of the week do you think a peak would be? What day would you think? Saturdays. Sundays. Sundays. Sundays and Sunday nights are the heaviest. When, you, when I break it down to hours, Sunday nights, right? Second most is not Saturdays, it's Fridays. Everybody's getting ready for the weekend. That's all I can determine, right? But so typically I see that now. What happens now is everybody's either, uh, I'm gonna fill my pool, I'm gonna top off my pool, I'm gonna power wash my house. Uh, this is the year I'm gonna have a lawn. Uh, I'm gonna plant some vegetable gardens. So we see it like this time of year. So in July, um, we'll see decent usage, but not the peaks. I might see seven, seven, two, but others, you know, I'll see seven, eight. You know, I see those like right about now. This has been so wet that my peak right now was actually yesterday, and it was only 5.6. Dave Murray's been selling a lot of plants, and people need yeah. to get their garden as well. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, the COVID year, uh, so 2019, when that first happened, I saw, uh, you know, I was at 8.2. Because what happens is when I'm at 80%, at 8 million gallons per day, that's when the red flag goes up saying, i got to start looking for another source, right? So when COVID hit, 
and everybody was home, I had a week's worth, it was dry. It happened to be dry and then everybody, everybody was home. And I was pushing 8, 8, 2, 8, 3, 8, 4, 8, 5, and I was gaining nothing. And I said, well, I've got a major break somewhere. And we have river crossings, right? So now you're looking, looking for places because a break that big, somebody drives by it, they're going to see it. They're going to fall into a hole. Nope, it wasn't going anywhere. We, we read the meters afterwards, and everybody was irrigating. Everybody was putting the flowers in. We were doing the same thing. I went night home, you know, it was, yep, this is the year. I noticed that you didn't mention a supplemental water source. Uh, the big pipes that came across Long Pond Road that have now been dismantled, or has the city written that off as an idea that never worked? So are these the lines you're talking about coming down Long Pond that was heading towards Turkey Pond? It came from Turkey Pond yep. all the way under the, uh, up yep. the Hot Winter Road yep. and across Long Pond Road and dumped into the south end of the pond. Yep. And, and quite frankly, I don't care. I just wondered yep. why you didn't mention it. So, um, I may not have mentioned that. Maybe I did. I thought oh, I did. Boy, yeah. I, I, yeah. 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 No, but, I'm, I'm, but, but I'm looking around and I see yep. people here who must remember the big yep. pipes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So that was in the 60s, correct? Late 60s? Yeah. 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 The records I saw was 68. So what happened was at that time they determined we got to do something that's a more permanent solution. The permanent solution was the, I, I was the building. That. Yeah. I mean, I, I truly understand. Yep. Okay. And the next thing is I have. Um, a suggestion for both you, Jim. Have you seen the village of West Concord history? Okay, mm -hmm. you might want to see it. Page sure. 37 has uh, some information in there about how they had steamboats on the pond. Really? And how they had yeah. braces and, uh, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And it came from a pretty good source who still is around. Uh, and there are people from the old waterworks who still live in Concord. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark would tell you who they are, uh, but you might want to add a few more details. This is one. Mm. The visuals are great, mm. but my human interest stories, sure. uh, you know, about someone who put on a diving suit and went down 15 feet sure. and, and had never done it before. Sure. Actually, he lived to tell the story. Uh, so, so there are some little vignettes, mm. if you would, that, sure. you, that are out there and they're uh, findable. Okay. Mm. Oh, and I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to learn the stories. Mark, does your 2040 planning at this stage even include where such a plant might be along the shores? Yes, and that is this slide right here. So uh, here's the existing water plant okay, on Hutchins Street. So here's North State Street. So, and water plants, you know, where, where you locate on a river, it's not just anywhere. You know, you've got to kind of find the right spot, and there's many ways to get water. Uh, there's radial collector wells. Manchester's finishing one up right now uh, in Hooksett. Uh, and actually, you know, you're, you're drilling on the side of the river and going under it, you know, using the gravels as a, you know, as a pre-treatment process. So we basically said, hey, whether we build a conventional plant like I would have now, uh, it's going to be, and we've identified four spots. So the city actually owns some of the property on the other side of the river. Uh, this larger stretch is pretty much right across from the current prison, okay, uh, where the stack is. Yeah, is little, it, is a little brewery Sewell's down there. Uh, where is Sewell's Falls, right? It's right a little here. further up. Uh, uh, yes. Hold on. Yeah, Sewell's Falls. Yeah, the bridge is here. So, yeah, yeah, you're down there. Yeah, so that's where we would look at. So it's in that general area. So what would happen is typically the 2040 plan in 2035, I'm out there on a boat and we're figuring out where this thing is going to be. And, you know, we've got geology folks that are saying, yeah, this is a good spot. You know, you don't want them on an outside corner. Uh, you know, if it's an intake, because that's where the silt goes in, you know, so you want to kind of on our inside. So there's a lot of science that goes along with where we would put it. So the state owns this property. We've already had a conversation with them and said, hey, uh, you know, don't sell that, you know, talk to us first. We've actually asked them if they would sell it to us now. They don't want to, obviously, they want to, you know, hold on, it was an option. Um, we own some of the property already on this side, and then uh, we would tie that into the distribution system down there. So yeah, you can see, you know, if I look down the road 40, 50 years, we'd have two plants. And one of the advantages of that is redundancy. So think about this right now. We have one water plant serving this entire community, right? If that caught on fire right now, we're in, we're in the papers. I'm firing up my one million gallon per day well field over in Pembroke. I'm pushing water in, but remember, I average four million gallons per day. 
right? I got a small line of connection with Bosco and they don't have much excess capacity other than that I'm the only game in town. So it gives that redundancy for a period of time where, hey, you know, if there's a problem at one, I've got the other one, right? Now that's not uh, specific to Concord. You know, Manchester has one plant, Nashua has one plant, you know, Portsmouth, uh, all these communities have that one plant, but it's that uh, redundancy. Oh, with this property? Yeah. Hmm. Not sure, actually. Up near like Hillcrest and almost to Lake Street. Could be. Where's Lake Street? Wait. Go up Lake Street. Somebody help me out here. Where Lake Street goes down to the reservoir, right? Yes. So that's Lake Street there. So this is North State. That's the North yeah, State. Yeah, so here's North State, and then here's Hutchins. Right, there's Fisherville right there. Yeah, and then there's Sewell's Falls. There's a big community that stopped developing. Yeah. And it was a lot of farmland. Yep. I think it's Abbott Farm. Yeah. Up near Hillcrest. Yeah, that's all farmland now or in current use property. That's on the other. Yeah, that's on the, uh, that side. Further. Mm. Further. Mm. Yeah. Do you have any flavor for what percentage of your water that's used is actually has to be treated with drinking water standards? How much is used for irrigation and big plots going on? Yep. Uh, so I'll throw I'll throw these numbers at you. So I produce on an average day, say four million gallons, right? If we look at just residential count, there's 42, 43,000 residences in Concord. Concord's a bit unique where a lot of people come work in Concord during the day. And then they go home, right? They, they live in other communities. So let's double that number. Let's say during the day, it's double. Let's round it up. Let's say it's 90,000 people. How much water does one person consume? Gallon? Let's, let's be conservative. Let's say a gallon. That's 90,000 that's 90, gallons a day. Let's round it up. Let's say 100,000 gallons a day, right, is used for consumption. I produce 4 million every day. So that balance is used for flushing the toilet, taking the shower, irrigation, you know, all of that stuff. So most of the water that we treat, I think, I've been a water person for my entire career. I look down the road and say, at some point in time, it's actually gonna make sense to have point of use treatment. What that means is, it's a paradigm shift, right? I clean the water right now and it's good, you know, go back 100 years, what was the water quality like 100 years ago? It's much better now, right? Our average life expectancy is much, much more than it was say, 100 years ago. A lot of that has to do with the water we consume, right? It's easy to regulate that for drinking and basically they say, I have to clean everything. When you look at treatment technology and you say, well, as they keep tightening up, you know, this, that, that treatment technology I have, at some point I ain't gonna be able to treat what they're, what they're gonna ask me to treat or require me to treat. But you have RO systems, you have other systems that are point of use, right? And that would be in your house. So in other words, can you picture 50 years down the road, you walk into my house and you're thirsty, and you're just looking for whatever, a red arrow or something that says you get your drinking water here. Because right? at some point, it's going to cost so much money for me to treat every gallon when only that small percentage is, is consumed. Well, I was looking at it a slightly different way. Mm. In terms of, once again, most of the folks here may remember there used to be one sewer system in Congress, and then mm. they had a big project that they separated the sanitary sewer yep. from the storm sewer because it was too expensive to treat all the rain. Yep. So, I mean, you um, yep, yeah, so that's been studied in Europe and it was an epic failure. The cost was much more to maintain the two distribution systems. And a lot of that gets into what's in the ground. Think of it this way, think about Roy, how much stuff is actually buried in the ground? Gas, sewer, drain, fiber, whatever the case may be, whatever's not on the poles. So in a lot of larger communities, you only have um, one bay. In other words, you have a water line that goes right here. And our things are physically big, right? So you got a 20, 24 inch water main that goes down. So now to have multiples, you just have no room in the roads. Now, unless you change and said, you know what, roads aren't going to be 50 feet wide anymore, they're going to be 75 feet wide. So a lot of thoughts going into that. I'm but not yeah. going to make okay. Marco stay on the line now. But ah. a couple I'm of happy more to. questions. Sure. In another presentation a few years ago, I was told that the Manhattan paper mills has a legislative right to control all the flow of the Kentucky River. Do you have to deal with that? So uh, I happen to be on the Kentuckook River uh, Local Advisory Committee, and I have a monthly meeting at the Mananoc Mill. So they cannot control 
what it is is DES control. So any flow that they uh, need to change has to be approved by DES. During dry years, they get direction from DES to release pulses. So they store it, and if DES says it's too dry downriver, you got to put in you know X amount of cubic feet for X amount of time. So they can't hold all the water back. I suspect that legislation will predate the DES. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. Yeah. And besides that, yeah. my dad, that paper bill doesn't use the water from the Catuga River because it's too dirty. Right. Yeah. They just use it in their cooling. Right? Yeah. They use it in their cooling process. That's all they do with it. Yeah. Yeah. I had a quick question for yourself. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. I think he had one there before. How is the Pembroke water treated, and where is it needed from there? So the Pembroke water is actually treated right on site, right? And and it's not a treatment system like you would think. All we do with that water. The gravel is actually the treatment process itself. So when it comes out of the ground, it's very clean. So we disinfect it, we adjust the pH, and then it pumps directly into the system over there. So it'd be like, you know, here's the water system. My water plant pushes into here. That one would push into there. Just interconnected by those 178 miles of pipe. Yeah. For many years on North State Street, there yep. used to be a, a little facility where there was a spring, and people mm -hmm. would go there and fill up water bottles and so forth. Yeah. Now it's all bricked off. Huh. Do you know what happened? I do not. Do you, anybody do else not. remember who used to call that? I heard it was contamination and it, that's why mm. they, and whether it was intentional or because of residential, or, mm. but I heard it was contaminated. Because it was, mm. it was right below the uh, Lake Street, kind of went from the Long down yep. Really? Two states. Huh. Some kind of yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd be curious. Yeah. Another question. Oh. Is the tank to the north of 393 the same sort of function as the one up here on Pentecook Street? Yeah, as a matter of fact, the one on Pentecook Street and that one are hydraulically at the same elevation. We call them the overflow. So, in other words, when I fill them up, they both overflow at the same exact time. Because that's what generates the pressure throughout the city, so we have pressure zones. You know those pump stations I was talking about where you create other ones? That's the main zone now. So that one actually that you see, yeah, if you go by, at, right when you're coming up to exit three, if, you, if, you're, if you're on 393 heading out and you see the sign for exit three, take a quick look over, directly across from that sign, you're gonna see this white dome in the woods. That's the tank you're talking about. That's 2.1 million gallons of stored water. Yeah. yeah. Folks, I gotta do a little advertising. We have our history book for sale. And there's a really good deal on it tonight for 20 bucks. And uh, I encourage you to take a look at that. I also, I'll come back, I thought I'd start another question. But remember, it's second Thursday next month. Uh, I hope you can be here on the page belting presentation. But it looks like we have one more question. Are the sure. Are about private wells? Yep. Are there many in concrete? There are, yeah. So um, I had one one uh, slide that showed the service area that I have. Um, anything outside of that service area as well. So basically, anything in the rural areas is is on a well. Yeah. Anybody in the city of Concord can they drill their own well? So yes. What happens with well drilling though is it's very restrictive. So there's setbacks with well radiuses. So there's a minimum 75 foot radius. So if you have a small lot in the city and you put it down, you've got to protect or own that 75 foot radius which puts you into neighbors houses and things like that. That's why you can have density with a public water system. You don't have to have these protected radiuses. Yeah. yeah. Quick comment to the room. Um, you were talking about the property with all of the two inch wells. Yep. Over here. Remember Wellfield. Yeah. Is at our greenhouse. We have a oh. single one. Yeah. And we're pumping eat with one arm on our back. We pump 12,000 gallons a day. Single one, yep. but our whole well is only 14 feet deep that waters the whole greenhouse in our water. Yep. That's a great aquifer. That's glacial till. It's nice uh, rock and sand. So, can I, Jim, can I do one more thing? So, listen, you don't get a lot of swag, you know, when you run a water department, but I've got, I got some coffee cups and what do I have? A, a stain, nice stainless steel water bottle, but you got to earn it. So, I'm going to ask, how many do I have? Five. I have five questions. Let's see if you can answer it and you can pick what you would like. Does anybody remember, first one to answer this, raise your hand. What city department currently occupies former station one? Roy. The fire department. You got it. Coffee cup or? I'll 
the last pick. Which one you want? I want the last pick. Oh, you want the last pick. Okay. All right. What is the capacity in million gallons per day of the water treatment plant? 10 million. Bingo. Coffee cup or stainless? Uh, coffee cup. Coffee cup. Okay. Uh, what school held rowing races on Pinnacook Lake in the early 1900s? Got it. Stainless. Yeah, there you go. That's the one. Make sure it's not one of your water. Hey, this is pretty good. You're welcome. All right, two more to go. Oh, uh, yes. How many acres encompass the Pentecook Lake watershed? Oh, that's a tough one. How about we can get close? Approximately. 2,984. Close enough. 2,496. I figured somebody said 2,500. All right. So you get a coffee cup. That's all that's left. You were up only a factor of 10. Right. All right. Last one. What year was the current water treatment plant constructed? 74. There you go. Here you go. 74. You got it. No, I can't take it on the plant. No, no, no. You take it. Otherwise, I got to bring it back. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, perfect. That's it. That's all we got. Oh, hey, thank you very much, Jim. Appreciate You're that. Welcome. All right, love it. Thank you. Folks, we'll see you next month. Thanks for coming.